Hello, I'm Rita Goldberg and welcome to you all on behalf of the Cary Lecture Committee and the Cary Memorial Library, both in Lexington, Massachusetts. We're able to offer a ser series of four free lectures each year, wholly supported by the Isaac Harris Cary Fund, which was set up by two sisters, Susanna Cary and Ellen Cary Farnham in 1921 to help educate the townspeople of Lexington. So we really are in our anniversary year or approaching it. They also gave our town our beautiful Cary Hall, now virtual for these lectures and other events, including town meeting. They belong to a different branch of the same Cary family that gave us our library. That's why it's Cary all over the place. Now, please listen to the rest because there's a lot of information in here, which I will go through as quickly as is decent. Um, first of all, please stay tuned for the remaining two lectures we have in this series. They will come in the spring of 2021. They include Professor Chad Williams of Brandeis University, who will speak on an early history of the Black Lives Matter movement, and that will be on Saturday, March 20th. And then the last lecture will be Dr. Paul Farmer, um, whom you may know from Partners in Health. He will be speaking on the color of COVID on Saturday, April 24th, most likely online, but we'll update you near the time in case there's a miracle. You can check details and register for the Zoom webinars on our website. Ours is carrylectureseries.org and the libraries is www.carrylibrary.org. We're delighted to say that we're partnering with Harvard Bookstore for this event. Uh, you can find Catherine's featured big books for this program. Some of them are on the screen in front of you and all of her backlist on the link that was in the program description. We'll send that link out again as well. We're always glad to support local independent bookstores. And now for Catherine Lasky's lecture itself, um, if you have questions after she concludes her talk, please press the Q&A button to submit questions. And if you want to just make comments, you can put those in the chat. So there's a little distinction. The questions go into the Q&A. Now, tonight, it's our pleasure to pre present, finally, Catherine Lasky, the author of over 100 books for children in a variety of genres. Her best-known series, The Guardians of Gahul, runs to 15 volumes and was made into an animated film, Legend of the Guardians, The Owls of Gahul. But she has created many other series as well, often but not always involving animals. I've been reading her series, Daughters of the Sea, set in New England, mostly in Boston and Maine, which so far is in four volumes. And like her other books, weaves fantasy and other elements like historical accuracy into unputdownable narrative. Her topic tonight is world building explorations, explorations in writing books for children. It's my honor to welcome Catherine Lasky to a virtual Lexington. Catherine, over to you. Okay, well, it's an honor to be here. I am not going to apologize for the delay because what could be better than being upstaged by Joe Biden? Um, a consummation devoutly to be wished. Uh, to begin with, I want to thank um, Rita, Mina, Alyssa, Kevin, who have so helped me learn about this Zoom stuff and are so supportive. And I want to ask or actually say a special thanks to all the teachers and librarians out there who are dealing with this disastrous situation. My heart goes out to all of you and the wonderful job you are doing. So um, I'm just going to begin by telling you about how I got started. And it's, uh, I started where I think a lot of people start as writers with stories of their own family. And um, the first book I ever wrote was that one right there called I Have Four Names for My Grandfather. And uh, it was 
I didn't have any children of my own, so I borrowed my sister's youngest kid and the grandfather, so that's my nephew, Tom, and the grandfather is my own father, Marvin Lasky. Uh, I then went on to write my first novel, The Night Journey, which was really about my father's family and how they came from Russia uh, around 1900. He was the first child born in this country. And unlike many immigrants, Jewish ones from Russia, Europe, he, they did not get off the boat uh, in New York on the Lower East Side. They got off a boat in Halifax and went way inland to Duluth, Minnesota, where my dad was raised. And um, I will also add that um, they belong to the same synagogue as um, Bob Dylan's family. And I had an aunt who used to play canasta with Bob Dylan's mother. So that, that's my biggest claim to fame in the world, I think. Um, but anyhow, the book Marvin of the Great North Woods has unfortunately become very timely again because it is about the 1918 pandemic. And by that time, my father, he was 11, 10 years old. His oldest brother had, was out on his own and he had um, four sisters. And my parents, grandparents were so nervous about him in this pandemic that they put him on a train in Duluth, Minnesota, and with his cross country skis, he was very athletic, and said, get off in Bemidji and um, ski in on this, uh, this logging road and a man will meet you at the end of the logging road. The logging road was about four or five miles long. And he was to stay there at the logging camp for the whole, um, winter and his job was to be the accountant he was very good with numbers and his other job was to wake up the lumberjacks in the morning if they overslept and he used to just tell my sister and me these stories about it and it was just fascinating so i, I wrote this book about it and he survived the pandemic this is um on the left side, those are my grandparents, um, Joe Las Joseph Lasky and his wife, Ida. And the picture on the right, the little guy with the cap on, that's my dad, Marvin. And he was uh, assistant um, to a milkman. So he's standing there in the milk wagon. So that's where I began. Although I like um, Marvin of the Great Northwoods came much much later in my writing career, but I still keep going back to my family. Then I got into doing, well, I don't like to call them nonfiction books because that just sounds so negative. So I call them informational books. And one of my early ones was called Vision of Beauty. And it was a story of Sarah Breedlove Walker. I can't believe that my phone is ringing. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. I thought I unplugged that. <laughs> sorry. But in any case, Sarah Breelove Walker was um, a, the creator of hair products for Black women. And she was also the first Black millionaire in the country. Um, and she became quite successful, so successful, she decided to build a big factory and she came to Indianapolis where I grew up to build that factory. And in Indianapolis, she was a real hero, um, mostly through, well, through her philanthropy. She just funded so many great things. And so I wanted to write a book about her. And then at the same time, I got the idea of writing one about Phyllis Wheatley, the slave poet from Boston, where I now live. Now you come in. So I went out to try and sell these books and uh, I was turned down because, you know, I, I wasn't black. And so even back then, and this is 20 years ago or so, it was, uh, you know, people were getting into own voice books. 
and I was kind of discouraged. But luckily, uh, I went to dinner one night at our across the street neighbors and who should be my dinner partner, but Henry Louis Gates Jr. And he said, I told him my sad story. He said, that's awful. He said, I don't believe in this. I don't believe in cultural appropriation. Uh, I think any and human culture is accessible to someone who makes the effort to understand and to learn and to inhabit another world. So um, buoyed by that, I went out one more time and sure enough, I sold the books to Candlewick Press. And um, those books are still in print and they have sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Now, here's another kind of informational book that I did um, when, oh, I, I can't really remember how long ago this was, but when the rainforest started getting attention as being in a precarious state, everybody was sort of, there were a lot of children's books, but they mostly focused on the whole rainforest. And it's such a complex environment. I just didn't want to take on the whole thing, but I, and this is very ironic, fell in love with the canopy. And I thought, I just want to do a book about the canopy. And um, so I found, now this is odd for a lot of reasons because I'm afraid of heights. Uh, but I found a woman canopy researcher, Meg Lauman, who, was one of the foremost canopy researchers. And I convinced her that we should uh, follow her and do a book about her research. And um, it was extraordinary. We did most of it in Belize and I just fell in love with the canopy. Uh, it is just a fascinating environment. And actually when you look down, if you're up in the canopy on one of these walkways or whatever that they build for research, it wasn't that scary because all you see below is more leaves. So it seems this like a floor of leaves. That's Meg with her two little kids um, that she brought along. Now another one, and my husband did all the photography, Chris Knight did all the photography as he did for the Monarch Butterfly book because I got interested in monarchs and their migration. And so there we are in Mexico, because that's where a lot of them go in the winter time. That's our daughter, who is now, you know, she's an NPR reporter, and uh, her name's Mara, but not, you might have heard her on the radio. But, um, and that's Chris with a butterfly on his head. And that's our son, Max, who's now in his early 40s, and um, he's he's resuscitating a butterfly that had been cold stunned. Now, this is a book that's coming out in just a couple of months called She Caught the Light. I'm very much into women scientists and um, she, Wilhelmina um, Stevens Fleming was the first woman to ever get an appointment at Harvard and she became the curator of glass plates. Her story is interesting. She came over from Scotland, got off the boat with her husband. She was pregnant and her husband just disappeared on the wharfs and she was alone and pregnant. So she had to get a job and she went and got a job as a cleaning lady um, at the residence of the director of the Harvard Observatory, which, their, their residence was connected right to the observatory. And um, Edward Pickering, who was the head of it, uh, he came home one day very frustrated with his graduate students and said they were ignorant and they couldn't do calculations and this and that. And his wife said, you know, you should really, you should really talk to Wilhelmina. I think she's really smart. And, um, have her go over there and show her what you're doing. And what they were doing was analyzing the spectra of, of stars. And that little thing she's holding up is a glass plate 
because that's how they recorded the spectrum before there was color photography. And she um, went on to do great things there. She also discovered the Horsehead Nebula. Um, now, I'm shifting into my historic, historical fiction is really my favorite thing to write. And I always, when people say why or whatever, I always quote this Hilary Mantel, what she wrote about it. She said, you don't become a novelist to become a spinner of entertaining lies. You become a novelist so you can tell the truth. And that's the way I felt. Now this was um, a book about the Salem witch trials and it annoyed me to no end. This is an old book too, because um, when Bill Weld was governor, there were these, um, well, he was governor, but there were these big signs uh, along route one, if you were he heading out to Salem and it showed a witch flying across a moon. They, they just had a lot of them around Halloween. And I found it abhorrent because there are still descendants of those people who were accused and, and hung in Salem. Their descendants still live out on the North shore, many of them in Salem. And I found this really offensive. So I wrote them and never got an answer back. Um, this is another one I wrote about um, the sort of the Underground Railroad um, told from the point of view of an escaped um, black girl from slavery and a girl in Boston. And then um, I know many librarians are familiar with the Dear America series and um, they several authors wrote them. They ask uh, several of the classic, including myself. And these are diaries kept by fictional girls about real events in American history. And when they called me up to see if I'd like to do one, I said, sure. And I said, well, has anybody um, taken the pilgrims yet? And they said, oh, no. And I, they said, that's really a good idea. I kind of thought, duh, gosh. Um, can I do it? And I, I did. And I thought I was um, uniquely qualified to do this. It starts on the Mayflower. And uh, another thing I have done, I know this is really crazy, but I have sailed twice across the Atlantic Ocean in a 30-foot boat with my husband. This was before we had children. And I wrote a, a grown-up book about that, um, a sort of memoir, um, and it called Atlantic Circle. And then, but getting back to Dear America, it was so good or so successful, all those books that they decided to do one about called the Royal Diaries about real princesses who had lived and kept fictional diaries. So again, they came to me and I said, um, well, has anybody chosen Elizabeth the first? And then again, they said, Oh, what a great idea. They'd chosen people like, you know, um, it, uh, Isabella of Spain and Catherine the Great, all this, and, but nobody had chosen, to me, she's just the canonical princess. So I did her. And I, I happen to just love English history and the whole Tudor thing. So more recently, I have this other, um, it's just a two book series, but it's about a girl um, who uh, travels in time back to um, the court of Henry VIII and in particular to um, the home, the palace of Elizabeth when she was just a girl. And um, I do a lot of research. I, I love research so much. It's hard for me to actually get to writing the book, but Elizabeth, spent a lot of her life at Hatfield Palace uh, and her father seemed to like to banish her there whenever he got a new wife um, during the honeymoon period, which could go on for a year or more. So I went to Hatfield and um, I don't know whether you can see on this picture because my screen's sort of blocking it, but that sort of 
lady walking there is me. Um, the, Hatf the Hatfield has been restored. Um, so I got to see a lot what it was like, but I really um, wanted to see Elizabethan dress up close and personal. And so to do that, I, I contacted Brandeis University, their theater department. And I said, could I come out and look at the costumes that you've used in like Shakespeare productions? And they said, yep, you can. And I went out, I loved it. This was one of the my happiest two hours of my research life. I tried on all these things. I tried to buy that off of them. They wouldn't part with it. Um, okay, now what I'm, I'm most known for, I guess, is my owl books that began in a funny way because I wanted, again, to do a natural history book about owls, an informational book, and have my husband photograph it. And he said, you're crazy. He said, you know, they're endangered. We'll be lucky if we ever find one. We'll have to go out in the woods at night and you know, freeze our butts off. Why, why don't you write a fantasy about owls? I thought, well, maybe. This was sort of the height of the Harry Potter fame. But I happened to get a call from the editor-in-chief of Scholastic, Gene Fywell at that point, about some contract issue. And um, she said, anything else on your mind? And I said, well, you know, I had this idea about a fantasy and I could just hear her sort of sink on the other end of the phone because they'd been inundated with, you know, Harry Potter wannabe books. And she said, oh, don't tell me it's about a wizard. I said, no, no, it's not, not about, I said, there's no humans in the book. It, it's, it's about owls. And um, she said, oh, that sounds interesting. She said, well, why don't you write me up something? So I wrote up just this, I had already written up a, just a little kind of pitch that was maybe 200 words long. And I sent it in to her. I faxed it in, I guess. Um, and she called me back within a half an hour. She said, this isn't one book, it's six. Well, it turned out to be 15. And this was the first one. And then, you know, there were 14 more. Now I'm lucky because I live about, I don't know, 2000 feet, if that, from the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And um, I made good friends with this guy, Jeremiah Trimble, who was the curator of birds. I, I met him because he knocked on my door. This is just the most serendipitous thing that's ever happened to me. Um, he knocked on my door one day while I was in my study, where I am right now, writing away on about the third owl book. And um, I, up to that time, I'd just done research, you know, by getting books and stuff like that. But <clears throat> he had a pair of binoculars on and he said, I don't mean to alarm you. Of course, I was very alarmed when somebody says that to you. He, he said, but um, an owl has been spotted right over your roof. Uh, I said, this roof? I, I, yeah, I said, point. I said, that's my study. I said, what? I said, what kind of owl? He said, an Eastern screech. And I said, that, that's, that's my main character in this book, Easel Rib. I said, this is incredible. It was like a muse had come. He said, well, we think he's been around here for a while. And maybe if you'd get an owl house he'd stick around so we he told us where to get one we invested in a little owl real estate and got an owl house and this eastern screech occupied it for about two years but right here so then that was i said look can i come over and talk owls with you and he said yeah we have a collection of about a thousand dead ones and this was in the old days before people were environmentally aware and that includes Harvard. Um, they used to just go out and shoot owls. Um, but then when they became more environmentally aware, what they did was they made a deal with the highway department of Massachusetts. Owls get hit a lot by cars. And if the bodies weren't you know, too, too smushed, um, Harvard would take them. 
And so there were a lot that, you know, um, weren't too bad. I'm looking at this, uh, a drawer full of barn owls. Uh, the main character in the story is uh, Soren and he's a barn owl. And he's just taking that one out for me to examine the feathers because it's an interesting thing. Barn owls, are all, all big owls, or most owls, have these fringe feathers that help them silence their flights. That's why they're so such quiet flyers is because they have these little fringe feathers, which I made a, up a word for them. I call them plummels in the book. I'm always making up words. And um, I wanted to see them. Now, oddly enough, these are little pygmy owls. No, these are elf owls, pardon me, I think. But elf and pygmy owls w that are much, much smaller, they do not have these um, fringe feathers. So they're, they're noisy flyers. Um, so then that was the movie that came out. It was so gorgeous. I can't tell you. And I got to go, to, it was Warner Brothers movie, but I got to go down to Australia where they did the animation. Oh, that was wonderful. And then, you know, they kept wanting me to do animals. It's sort of funny because I really don't like animals that much. I mean, we don't have any pets. Our kids, of course, have their revenge now. Our daughter has six cats. Our son has a dog, but I, I, I don't like um, animals as pets. I don't particularly like touching animals, but I love writing about them. So again, I did a lot of research, went back to the Harvard Museum, looked at all these bones they have of, um, of wolves. I, just, I know way more about uh, wolf um, teeth than I do human teeth. And then I did um, bear books. That was fun because we went up to the Arctic. We went on a natural habitat trip and we went up to Manitoba and saw the bears just as they were just try getting to move off land onto the Arctic uh, or the Arctic. I mean, the um, ice. ice of, of the um, Bay, Hudson's Bay. But that was great. Now we get to, this sounds weird. Well, I told you already that historical fiction is my favorite kind of um, fiction. Within that, I have a fascination with World War II and I'm not sure how this happened, but I started reading World War II books when I was, I don't know, in about the fifth grade. And so um, I read Stalag 17, Slaughterhouse Five. By, I had to read that because it, by Kurt Vonnegut and I come from Indianapolis, which is where Kurt Vonnegut grew up. Uh, I read From Here to Eternity, I read The Naked and the Dead when I was in the sixth grade. You know, my, it was just around. My parents were reading it. I just picked it up after them. I read all, you know, a lot of Holocaust books, Diary of Anne Frank, um, all of those. Sophie's Choice, that was my favorite Holocaust book. Um, now, what I have written about so far are World War II books, but never really from a Jewish point of view, although I'm Jewish. Now, my first one was called Ashes that was set in Berlin in 1933, which was the year of the book burning, the big book burning in Berlin. And it um, was told from the point of view of a girl whose father taught at the University of Berlin, who, who was uh, actually a, a, so, a colleague of Einstein, although Einstein had left in 32. But um, she, he was in the physics department. And then the next World War II book I wrote was from um, the point of view, the extra of a um, gypsy girl, a Roma girl who had been interned, uh, turned 
uh, in a um, a camp, uh, concentration camp that was mostly gypsies. And her story was that this is based on a true story, but it's fiction, historical fiction, was that Lenny Riefenstahl um, wanted to make a dramatic movie. She'd always been making documentaries and, you know, she was Hitler's favorite filmmaker. But she wanted to do, and she wanted to star in the movie. She wanted to direct the movie. And it was about a Spanish dancer or something who falls in love with a Spanish nobleman. And she was, of course, going to do the dancing because she fancied herself quite a dancer. The only thing she couldn't do was um, ride a horse. So she needed a, a stunt woman to ride the horse. And she got a girl. And it was this, because they started filming in Spain, but then the Spanish Civil War happened. They had to stop filming. But in 1941, she decided, oh, well, I can make that film. Uh, we'll just go and make it in Austria because you know how much Austria looks like Spain. And um, I'll get for extras, I will get gypsies, Roma people. So that was that book. Now, Night Witches is my most recent World War II book. And it came out a couple of years ago. And it is about this um, team of young Russian female pilots. They ranged in age from about bombers. Um, they ranged in age from about 17 to 27. And um, they, they uh, flew these flimsy little planes uh, that were called PO2s, Polokarpov, um, designed them. And they were designed to train people how to fly. And also they were kind of like crop dusters. And they, they had very low speeds. They couldn't go more than about, they could fly as low as 90 miles an hour, which is really slow. So that meant all the German planes would overshoot them, but they flew without lights and they just would bomb the hell out of all these um, places where the Germans were stowing stuff, you know, supplies and all of that ammunition. And they really defended um, uh, Stalingrad. And so that was that story. Now, just a second, to come out next fall is my fourth World War II book. Again, and something odd happened with this one. Uh, again, uh, it's told, it's about a girl spy, an Indi a British girl and her whole family. They're all spies and they are part of a division of MI6 that nobody knows about. And the reason I'm calling it faceless is that these people, who are in this division, it's called the Rasas. It's named for Tabula Rasa. Nobody can ever remember their faces. You know, there is that cognitive disorder called face blindness. Well, this is as if the whole world has it in reference to these people. They cannot remember their faces. So what would make for a better spy? So this is the story of my little hero. And she is there in Berlin, her father's in charge of the Reich garage, which did exist. And she and her mother are infiltrating various organizations and she is infiltrating Hitler's household. And um, so I wrote this book and it's, edited and all of that. And then something that has never happened in my decades of writing happened where I was supposed to get the advanced reading copy and I get a call from my agent and she says something very peculiar has occurred. And she said, I want you to know your, your editor is as upset as I am and you will be. Oh, Jesus, what have I done? And it's, it wasn't what have I done, it was what I hadn't done. They have a sensitivity committee at the publishing house 
and they felt I had not made the book Jewish enough. And I said, well, what are they talking about? Of course, it's not told from a Jewish point of view. I said, this isn't really a Holocaust story. It's a spy story. And that's when I said, look, I'm not changing a word, but I can write a letter to the reader at the end of the book that explains why I'm doing it this way and why I have told every World War II book um, from a point of view of a, a non-Jewish person, even though I lost 18 of my cousins of my generation in the camps. So um, I've done that. I think the book's going forward. Uh, but the reason that I wanna tell these stories, as I said earlier, uh, Sophie's Choice was just the best Holocaust book I've ever read. And I think it was because it, this horrific story came through the voice of the character Stingo, who was this innocent, handsome, young Southern guy, came from the South, he wasn't Jewish, but he's telling this story. And it's what came across was empathy in that book. And I think empathy is a driver for me in all of my books. I always wanna know, well, what made somebody like Oscar Schindler who was a member of the Nazi party, rescue 1,200 Jews. To me, that is really fasc fascinating. And I think, I, I keep thinking, were these non-Jews, I mean, they weren't all complicit with Hitler and the Nazis. Many of them really felt empathy. What was going through their minds? And that's, to me, I feel that when I write a book like that, it's really empathy that drives me. That's when I'm sort of at my best. Uh, I know I can tell a compassionate war story, the best war story, if I'm working through the eyes of another person. And that's when I feel that I'm most revolutionary and most authentic in my writing. And so I think it's all going to work out okay. But I'll tell you, a month ago this time, I was really oh, feeling pretty bad. But I have hope and, and people, I have a lot of people who's come to my aid and support. And now I think that's a about all I have to say, but I'd love to talk uh, more about, you know, answer your questions, really. All right. Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa. I am the head of youth services at Cary Library, and I will be moderating our Q&A this evening. Just a reminder, if you have questions for Catherine, please put them into the Q&A box. So we'll get started. Um, our first question tonight is what makes you write books for children and not adults? Oh, I have written books for adults. Just mine minimized. Um, just a minute. I have to do you something. Never do it with your mouse. Oh, just a minute. I'll be back with you. I have, I have written many books for adults. I wrote one called The Widow of Oz. I wrote Atlantic Circle. I wrote a home... Um, mystery series, well, four books years ago uh, called, let's see, Trace Elements is the first one, I think, and then Mortal Words. So I've written um, several books for grownups, but I kind of like writing for kids better. Um, how do you make up your characters' names? Um, I don't know, they just sort of come to me, you know? Um, and I, I, I have to think for a while, but by the time I write very elaborate proposals and it's usually during the proposal time that I, I, I settle on a name. Yeah, so there's no big secret to it. <laughs> in, your, in your writing process, are you more of a plotter or are you more of a pantser? Do you plot out what you're gonna write or do you just 
go where the writing takes you. I'm a plotter. I'm a plotter. I do very elaborate outlines. I, I first write um, proposals. And if it's for a picture book, my proposal can be four times longer than a picture book. Um, and if it's for a novel, I write out a very big proposal pitch letter for the, you know, publisher. And I'll write out a chapter or two, but I, I am a very dedicated outliner, which the publisher never sees because my outlines are very confusing. And they're sort of like the Rosetta Stone, only I understand them. And I write a general one. And then as I go along, I, I write more and more outlines. Um, so I can wind up by the end of a novel, I can have 15 outlines. Oh, They're progressive. Wow. They go, you know, from one action to the next or scene or whatever. Wow. Um, are you going to write a third Tangled in Time book? I don't think so. I'm sort of on to other things now. So I don't think so. Maybe, you know, sometimes you come back to stuff. Um, so this is a comment and question from Jacob. Hi, Catherine. I started writing the Guardian series when I was reading the Guardian series when I was eight and finished when I was 17. Ah. Remained enamored the whole time. Do you have any tips for writing stories that will resonate with people of all ages? Well, I don't know. Um, it is true um, that the Guardians of Gahul resonated with all ages. And I can remember, um, I a friend of mine who teaches at Harvard, and I love her course, Maria Tatar, and uh, she teaches a sort of folklore fantasy course. I think it was called the Perspective of Childhood through Literature, and I audited it once. And um, afterwards, these kids came up to me, and they said, "Are you Catherine Lance?" I said, "Yeah, I am," and they said. Oh, we read your books. And see, in my mind, those kids had frozen when they were like eight years old, like the boy who wrote in. And now they're they're like freshmen and sophomores at Harvard. I mean, that would, and of course, then I think, well, geez, I'm so old myself. <laughs> and yeah, it was very, uh, it wasn't a disconcerting experience, but it was a shocking, because in my mind, I just see kind of, middle grade kids there. So I, sh I shouldn't mention I was a reader of your books when I was a kid either. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, so what is your favorite species of owl? What, what's my favorite what? Species of owl. Um, well, I guess it's the barn owls. They're very dramatic looking. They have those bright white and their heart-shaped faces and their federation around their faces is so great. Uh, so I, I guess they're, but um, they have a horrible hoot though. It's really screechy. And actually um, screech owls don't have such a terrible hoot. So I don't know how that, you know, I don't know who, who decided to name these. But. <laughs> So what is your opinion on further adaptations of the Guardians of Gahul series, such as a sequel to the film, a television adaptation, graphic novels? Um, I would love to see uh, animated television series. I think we all need it during the pandemic. And I have so many more owl stories in mind that, um, I, I think that that the animal logic's got to get busy again <laughs> and then and, and make a whole TV series. How long does it take you to write a novel and how many revisions do you typically do? Well, I, I don't know. It takes me, I'll say eight months to get a draft that I want to send in to the publisher. And that's probably like my 18th draft or so. And then by, I can go up to 22 drafts of it now, but it's, it's usually, by the time I have a 15th draft, I can send it in to 
the um, publisher. And then, you know, they want me to do more things. So do maybe three or four more, I guess. Have you ever worked on building a world or an idea for a book to the point of doing some writing and planning and then ended up scrapping it? Um, no, when I get to that point, well, for me to even start a proposal that the idea has to have been drifting in, around in my head for a good long time. And sometimes they drift, drift away but I've never scrapped a book I did. Now that's not saying I have sold every book that I have written a proposal and all that for. I have not sold every book. Um, and, but they're, they're back there somewhere where I will, um, somebody might buy the proposal someday and then I'll finish the book. Do you ever get so invested in your characters that you feel a sort of loss when you're done writing about yes. them? Yeah, I do. I really do. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions that are interested in how, when you talked about how you were coming up with words. So could you talk a little bit more about kind of your naming conventions and how you make up the words that you make up? Well, I love making up words. So I have a whole spreadsheet or an Excel sheet of different languages that I made up for the owl books. And um, my favorite um, language that I made up for owls who live in the northern part, most northern part of that imaginary kingdom is Krakish, which is sort of a cross between Yiddish and Norwegian. I know that sounds really weird, but, um, you know, I, I, um, well, well, like Plummel's, that's, that's not Krakish, that's just straight old Gahulian, as I call it. Um, Plummel's just seem like the right word for these soft little fringe feathers, you know? Um, so that just comes to me that way, those, those words. What is it like to write diary entries from the perspective of someone else? How do you get into their head? Well, it's interesting, like um, with uh, Elizabeth the first, when I wrote that um, book, the Royal Elizabeth Red Rose of the House of Tudor for the Royal Diaries, I read a lot about her. And I found a book in the Cambridge Public Library that I think I was the first person to have checked it out in 50 years. And I'm surprised they because I they just didn't, you know, give that book away because I think, you know, if a book hasn't been checked out in 50 years, sometimes they just toss them or sell them, I guess. And it was Elizabeth's letters. And there were a lot, not all of her letters, but um, now her voice was very different from um, a girl of today. Uh, first of all, she was so smart. She spoke Greek and Latin and French and Italian, and she wrote a sonnet or something for her Catherine Parr in Italian, trying to, you know, make nice with her new stepmom. And, but there's something that comes through. She, I, I, I sensed her loneliness when she talked about how she hoped the king would let her come back to court and stuff like that. And that's what doesn't change emotions of these girls, whether they live you know, as a pilgrim landing on Plymouth Rock or as Elizabeth I. There's an emotional constancy of these girls and boys. So what are your top three pieces of advice that you would give to someone who would like to become a children's author? Well, uh. My first thing is you must read and read widely. I read everything. I read science. I, I mean, you know, like I'm not a scientist by any means, um, but I love reading about it. Uh, and then I used to go and audit Stephen Jay Gould's courses at Harvard. I love those courses. Then I audited one on primatology at Harvard. 
And so I would, I would do the readings that the kids at Harvard were doing. But I mean, I just always read a lot. And I, I, I read a lot of historical fiction. And um, let's see, I, I, so that's number one advice. The number two advice, I don't know. I, you know, write down your ideas and know that not all ideas are going to work, but, you know, just take baby steps into those ideas the way I do. I try to write a paragraph about what, actually, one thing I do is when I'm setting out to write a proposal about a book, I try to write the first paragraph like jacket copy for the book because I want to hook an editor. So I just try to do sort of, maybe you'd call it expanded jacket copy, get the nut of the book in a hundred words or less. And then I kind of do, so that that's second piece of advice. And third piece of advice is do some planning, outlining, but that's my style. And maybe other people, you know, you gotta find your own style, but those are my three pieces of advice. So when did you know you were destined to be a writer? Never. <laughs> I mean, well, never. No, that's not true. Actually, I was really encouraged by my parents. And um, I remember, and this is a story I'll never forget, and I think I've told it several times, but I, you know, I came from Indiana, and we had um, a house on a lake up in northern Indiana. And um, I remember one night we were driving in our convertible car. This is I'm telling you, it's back in the 50s. And we were going to get, going to an A&W root beer stand to get a root beer float. And it was night. And my sister and I were in the back seat and we both had our heads back. And we were looking just up at the sky and it was such interesting cloud formation. The clouds were just covering. And I, but the moon was behind the clouds, which made them look kind of wooly. And I said to my mom, I said, mom, that's a sheep back sky up there. And my mom said, oh, Catherine, you should be a writer. And I took that advice seriously. They, they supported all that kind of stuff in me, yeah. So, um, what is your favorite historical fiction series or book and what books would you recommend to read for kids that are 10 to 15 years old? Oh my gosh. I don't know whether I've ever read a historical fiction series other than those diaries, the Royal Diaries and the, um, uh, the Dear America Diaries. People just didn't write in series for those books. Um, I've read Ken Follett, but he doesn't exactly do series. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Uh, a book you would recommend for a reader that's 10 to 15 years old. Oh my gosh. I don't know. There's so many great books out there. You know, I just did something where I had to select um, books for an event at the Boston Public Library, uh, a board of a, so they, they had an auction. I don't know whether, they, oh, it's already over. But they asked me to select five books for readers of just that age, uh, not my own, the other, and I like that. So I selected To Kill a Mockingbird, Lois Lowry's book, The Giver, Swallows and Amazons, and oh my gosh, I can't write, remember the other two books. I mean, real classics, you know. Um, maybe The Secret Garden, I think. That, that book had a great effect on me, The Secret Garden. Yeah. Um, we have a couple questions about writer's block. How do you deal with writer's block? How do you move through it when you get it, if you ever get it? I really don't get it, and I think it's because I plan my books out so completely. So I don't get it, you know? And if, if I do kind of start to stumble, I just think, well, what do I want to happen in 
this chapter? Where do I want to be? And if I can't figure that out, I say, well, where do I want to be in the next paragraph? And I can't figure that out. I say, what do I want the next sentence to be? That's how, you know, I just sort of inch through it. This is a fun question. All right. My favorite New York Times book review question. You are having a dinner party. What oh. three authors would you invite to the dinner party? Well, I'm lucky because I've had a lot of great authors at a dinner party. <laughs> um, and okay, a friend of mine is um, listening out there and she actually hosted this dinner party. It was great. So it was Lois Lowry, Gregory Maguire, and Neil Gaiman. That sounds like a fun party. I had two more to add. I think, well, can, can you add dead people? Sure. No rules. Probably, but she might not want to come. I think she was kind of shy. And then I'd invite Truman Capote because <laughs> I know they got along. <laughs> Do you feel like there's a relationship between animal stories and war stories? Well, there's a lot of wars in my animal books and they are often modeled after wars, real wars. Like um, there was a big battle scene in one of the Al books that is absolutely the Normandy invasion. And then there is, um, oh, there was a classic what was a class? I can't, it just escaped my mind. A classic Persian battle. The movie The 300 was based on it, you know, that battle. Um, a lot of classic Thermopylae. The, the, that, thanks to my husband here. <laughs> battle of Thermopylae was a great one to model things after. So, yeah. Um, have you ever considered writing a fantasy book about grizzly bears since they are important in the Wolves of Beyond books? Uh, well, I got as far as polar bears. So I don't know whether I want to switch species. So maybe, you never know. Um, who was Einstein's colleague in 1932 that you write about in Ashes? Um, well, it's, um, I made him up actually. Uh, however, he is based on a guy who became sort of distinguished for um, photographing. He was very good at photographing stars. I mean, that was um, a lunar eclipse, no, solar eclipse that what happened in Russia in about 1919, I think. And I found his work and I just made up a character to go with that work. Um, someone would like to know if the owl in the frame behind you is from one of your books. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Somebody, people just besiege me with owl things. I mean, um, I can reach any place in my study and get an owl stuffed owl. Here's one right here. <laughs> and I have about 20 more around. Um, and then they made a set of them after the movie and you could buy them on, on Amazon. So I have several, and my husband's going to retrieve some of those. Um, yeah. So here, I have a bowl full of owls, baby <laughs> owls, baby owls. Yeah. Those all came from the, I don't know, whatever they made up at Warner brothers and then they got onto Amazon. All the merchandising. The merchandising, yes. So what uh -huh. is different about writing for children and what do you change to reach children in particular? Um, what is different about writing? For, it, well, it, 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 it must be very subtle because I'm not aware of changing it. I, I think the only thing I change is the age of the characters and, and the emotions that they might be experiencing but that's all that really changes you know um do you have any plans to write a picture book for children in the near future yes but i won't tell you what it is <laughs> and assuming you have ideas for future books anything you can tell us about any future books no, I never talk about my future books, never.
because I feel that you can talk a book out if you start talking about it too much and telling the way that you can't do that. You have to sit down and write a book or write a plan for a book. Yeah. So you've won many awards. The New a Newbery Honor, the Jewish Book Award. Is there one that's given you particular pleasure? Yes. And it's the one I got from, I don't know where that book, oh, here it is, Amnesty International. And this has for the extra because um, this has particular meaning for me these days because of the unfortunate event that happened with Faceless and it not being Jewish enough. And as I told you, the extra is from the point of view of a gypsy girl and the Amnesty International, it says, as awarded by Amnesty International as contributing to a better understanding of human rights and the values that underpin them. And they did not have that problem with me not focusing on a Jewish child in a concentration camp. As I said, it's always writing from that other point of view and finding empathy that drives my work. Um, how has your writing process changed with the pandemic? Not at all. The only thing is, you know, I can't go to the library and browse. And so that's, that's hard for the research a little bit, but luckily I got all my research done for face. I had the book done by the time the pandemic came out. So that was good. So I've had to buy a lot of more books, you know, from Amazon and bookstores. Well, bookstores aren't open either, but um, yeah, it's hard in that way. Are there any professional challenges for you as a writer with such a breadth of interest and in different types of books? I don't know what you mean by professional challenges. I mean, what I told you about Faceless, that was a professional challenge. That's the most serious one I've had, yeah. Well, it looks like we are out of time. If I did not get to your questions, I apologize. We had so many wonderful questions this evening. Thank you so much, Catherine, for your time. We greatly appreciate it. And I want to thank you and Mina and Alyssa and Kevin and Rita. Really, you've made this so nice. Yes, and thank you. And Catherine, thank you for running a little longer. <laughs> we were in the background saying, oh, do you think it's okay we go a little longer because we had so many questions and so many things, but uh, it's been a joy to have you. And I really appreciate your staying on a little longer. For those of you on the call, the Harvard Bookstore is featuring Catherine's books. And uh, you can feel free to go there to their website and order the books. Um, certainly, it's it's always good to uh, patronize our local bookstores. You know, they they play such a key role in our society. And also, uh, please keep in mind that, as uh, Rita mentioned at the beginning, we have lectures coming up uh, in March. We have uh, Professor Chad Williams on March twentieth who's gonna be sharing the early history of the Black Lives Movement. So please come to the Carrie Lecture Series website to register. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Catherine, thank you very much again for this wonderful evening. Uh, please, everyone, stay safe, stay well, and have a peaceful Thanksgiving. Good night. Good night.